Tony to be so young and to have the commitment that they had, the vision that they had, and to put it, <coughs> to put it in place. So in my mind, they are a very good example of the kinds of things that I'm going to share with you today. So when I do that, I hope that uh, you recognize them and recognize yourself, as well as recognizing some possibilities uh, for yourself. I, I want to thank my friend Tony for inviting me. They've been a big support, and I love working with you. I'd also like to acknowledge Monica Taylor, whom I get the privilege of working with a lot in the Journey for Success pro program. She is just very special and beautiful. April and her team of angels have done all of this to put it together, and you know, they are so fabulous. They treated me like I always want to be treated. <laughs> uh, also, I uh, want to um, acknowledge Alvita and the wonderful panel this morning. Could we do that? <laughs> some of the ideas that they had. But what was most uh, distinguishable about the morning for me is that they made it real. They took what you read, heard about uh, Cheryl uh, Sandberg's book and made it real and told the stories out of their lives that makes successful women become successful. Also, they were so authentic because they also shared with us some of the mistakes, some of the hardships, the lessons that we learned. And before I go any further, I would like to say one thing about that, is that is an example of what successful women do differently. That is, they own who they are, they own their success, but they look back they make course corrections along the way. That's what some of what Monica was saying just a moment ago with respect to when she was sitting on the floor crying because it wasn't perfect. And sometimes, and I sure do, we make the mistake of thinking it's got to be perfect. But you know what? In this moment, the right people are here. The white people are here to do what it is that we have to do today. We're sorry for anyone else that, that missed it, but this is who is supposed to be here now and in this place. And the same thing with Journey for Success and the other initiatives as they go forward. You'll have the right people in place and you will accomplish what it is that you said. It may not look like you thought it would look getting there, but it will turn out in the way that you wanted it to turn out. Okay, so I want to say uh, a shout out to uh, women from Journey for Success that are here. I see some coaches and uh, earlier today uh, participants uh, in the program. These are fabulous, fabulous, fabulous women doing great things in their lives and beginning to do great things in the lives of others. <clears throat> so what is leading in? What did Cheryl Sandberg mean when she said lean in? Think about that. I'm sure that you reflected on it. I'm sure that you've been reflecting on it since you heard the women speak this morning. What does it feel like? Close your eyes for a moment. What do you imagine it really means to lean in? If you could taste it, what would it taste like? That mousse that's decadent in front of you? What would it smell like? Fabergé? What would it be like? So I want you to experience now, beyond what you've heard, what you've read, what you've thought about, 
I want you to experience what it's like in your body to lean in. So turn to the neighbor sitting beside you. You might need to push your chair back just a little bit, and that won't be bad, so you can be comfortable with that. <laughs> now, just turn to that person, and I mean, really look at them. Now, all right, before you start giggling, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay to look at your neighbor. Now, come on, you're not looking at your neighbor. <laughs> What I'd like for you to see there is an opportunity, an opportunity for an empowering relationship, an opportunity to be with someone in a way that supports what you are about and what they are about. So I invite you now to physically Lean in. Lean in. Lean in toward that person. All right, I'm going to ask you to do it again, and this time I want you to do it in silence, and I want you to actually notice what it feels like physically in your body as you lean. So again, lean in. What does it feel like? What thoughts are in your mind? What are you saying to yourself other than I feel silly? <laughs> Thank you. Now, why did I have you do that? And was that a silly thing to do? Well, maybe. It's kind of fun. But the reason I ask you to do that is because I believe, and there's a lot of research behind that as well, but I believe that the body remembers. That the body remembers. And sometimes we will do things or things will happen that we don't think about. And we think, oh my goodness, it's been such a long time since I've done that. I didn't know I'd remember. Remember riding a bike? Any one of you in here that has ridden a bike before, if you got out here on the beach today, you would know how to ride that bike. The body remembers. If you uh, remembered a favorite song, and one day it just starts coming out of your mouth, the heart remembered that song. So now if you're going to step into the space of opportunity, I invite you to seize the moment and lean in. Lean in and listen. Lean in and notice whether there are any opportunities here for you today to actually take the next step forward uh, in your own life. So today, there are three things that we're going to offer here for you to consider. And the first one will be that transformation is personal. Cheryl uh, Sandberg said that this leaning in was about transforming our lives. Yes, transformation is personal. She also said that um, Passion, as you heard this morning. Talent, skills, interest are essential, that they matter, and they do. And you, you in your chair, every one of you, you have that. It's already in you. I believe that was how Alveda opened the morning. And I want to second that. You already have it in you. How you walk out of this room today and use it in your life is what will make uh, the difference. So number one, transformation is personal. The second thing 
and I believe it was Mrs. Screech. I said, oh, hey, this is really cool, because I'm going to get to reinforce this later. She said, it's all relational. She's right. Transformation is relational. And there are many ways and many opportunities for us to bring the empowering relationships in our lives, those that make a difference for us and those that make a difference in the lives of others. And the third thing that we're going to talk about uh, today is that transformation is making a difference. And you know, as I stand here in front of you, it actually makes me think about service. And I think that I would step out there a little further and I would lean into my own meaning here and say that transformation is characterized by the service that we do. Not just making a difference in my life and the others lives but i want you to understand what i really mean i actually mean service like the service that the coaches provide in the journey for success program the service that monica and tony provide in bringing these events and other initiatives to the community like the service and civic engagement that the Junior League brings to our community. So transformational, transformation is personal. Transformation is relational. Transformation is making a difference, being in service. So I'm gonna ask you if you will listen for a moment while I share with you uh, something that A.D. Lina, a psychologist, said that I picked up a few years ago, I shared it with uh, in Journey for Success. But it makes all the sense in the world to me about what we're talking about when we're talking about personal transformation. First of all, he said, the range and depth and breadth of what we say, think, say, and do is limited only by the way that we notice. And because we fail to notice that we fail to notice, then there is little change that can occur. He goes on to say, and when I begin to notice that I have failed to notice, then my words, my deeds, my actions, my thinking will expand. Now, I can paraphrase that a little bit. I took a little liberty. But it says just that. So failing to notice and, and noticing that you fail to notice will help to shape what you do, what you think, what you speak, and how you listen. I want to invite you to uh, think about um, uh, what was going on in your head when I asked you to turn to your neighbor. You don't have to say anything about it out loud, but what was, what, what voice did you hear? Did it say, oh my God, this is silly. I feel so strange looking in a woman's eyes. Uh, let me turn and look back at Pat rather than look directly at the woman, as if you couldn't hear without looking. What else did you think? It is that little voice 
that is always talking, always speaking. So, the woman that you looked at a moment ago, when you are interacting as you were during the luncheon period with that person, there were two of you there, but there were four conversations going on. There was a conversation of what you were saying. There was a conversation of what you were saying. Ah, but that other conversation was what you were saying to you. Now, I don't agree with that. Ah, oh, isn't that a wonderful idea? I think I'll steal it for my next workshop. Whatever that was, it is that little voice. And if you don't walk out of here with anything else today, leave noticing that little voice. Because that little voice is your best tool for personal transformation. And noticing what comes up with that little voice that expresses your attitude about something, that perhaps your judgment about something else or somebody else, if that is not who you want to be, then you have in that moment the opportunity to seize the moment, lean in, and shift your mindset. Shift the way in which you see the other person or whatever it is that's going on around you in your environment. You get to choose then. Now, I'm sorry to tell you this. You might not like me after this, but you're never going to be the same now because you're going to always notice that little voice talking and you're going to either be up to choosing or actually choosing not to choose. And then you get to say, well, okay. And you know what? Sometimes it is okay to choose not to choose. But the most important thing is knowing that that is what you did. That is the difference in what successful women Women who want to transform their personal lives, their personal way in, of being, such that they are not limited in what they do, in the way they be, in the relationships that they build. Now, one last thing about that. Uh, I had a friend, uh, and we went to um, uh, her house for dinner at Thanksgiving. And you know, nobody cooks at Thanksgiving like they used to, like my grandmother did. But anyway, she had everything except my own daughter. My youngest daughter still cooks that way. And she hardly remembers her great grandmother. But anyway, she had this big spread out. And she had a great big pan uh, that she had the turkey in and it was a actually a small turkey because she had ham and she had something else and something else. So, you know, so I said, uh, Tony, what are you, what, what are you uh, what, why'd you put this turkey in this big pan? Oh, girl, this is my grandmother's pan and I always cook this turkey in this pan. I, I said, but you really didn't need this larger pan, did you? Why did you use it? Why did your grandmother use this pan? She stopped his job. I never thought about it. <laughs> but that was just what we did. We used this large pan. And so every year I used this large pan, whether I need it or not. <laughs> How many of you would say there are some things like that that I do? Just raise your hand. I want to know you're here with me. <laughs> so um, that is, again, not noticing. We don't need that anymore. Uh, you know, the technology is such that, you know, I have to think about, oh, I could use my Google to get that information. This current generation, the first thing they think about is go to their cell phone and do whatever it is that they need done. Uh, but I have to think about it. But I am interested in being a part of the new technology 
and I'm taking it as far as I can take it, um, and I'm slow, but I'm, I'm in there uh, and willing to shift. I made a big shift. I decided that in my office, I didn't need a whole separate number for faxes because nobody was sending me faxes anymore. I needed to have a fax machine because occasionally that was a useful way to send, to communicate. But it, the next thing is go, that's going is probably the telephone. <laughs> Only kidding. Our relational transformation. Transformation is relational and creating the beloved community. So now, I know that each of you networks a lot. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to quote Helen Keller. She said, we can do little alone. We can do little alone. But we can do much better together. Now think about that for a minute. We can do little alone. So that means we might alone be able to do this much. Hey, that's really good. But together, we can do much better. I think that's pretty incredible. And uh, with her, given her experience, she learned that over her life with the, her struggles and the difficult times that she had with frustration. We can do little alone, but what we do together is much better. So, in building and creating empowering relationships, there are a couple of things that come to mind, and that is one, collaborating. The person next to you, and the other seven, eight, six, four people at your table are possibilities, are opportunities for that. Creating partnerships, they may be business partnerships, they may be an event partnership. Someone is here with April who says, we are colleagues and I'm here from California and I just came to help her. Jill, collaborating empowering relationship for a friend to come to California, from California, to support me in my event. Supportive relationship. And partnerships in making it all work. Partners in making it all work. Networking. Now, how many of you have been to a networking event? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Well, and you know, these are your, this, is, this is an opportunity for networking as well. How many of you passed out your business card at a networking event? Thank you. How many of you told the people that you met ad nauseum what it is you do? <laughs> and listen to what it is they do. And how many? Has it gone in one ear and out the other ear? How many times has that happened? How many times have you left with the intention, oh, I really loved hearing what Monica uh, um, had to say. That sounds like a wonderful organization and I'd love to work with her sometime. I'll give her a call and probably told Monica that. <laughs> Two years later, has Monica heard from you? <laughs> probably not. Probably not. Some of you probably also belong to networking organizations. I just recently, I was, I was in a networking, business networking organization for about two years. I love the people in there. You know, it felt like we were friends. They're making friends. We supported each other and, you know, referrals, etc. I left the group. How many have I heard from? One. And there's a second that we are collaborating together. And I'm hearing we're in touch with each other. 
They loved me to death. Oh, they used to tease me. We had great times together. But we did not establish the fundamental of networking, of what networking really is. It is about getting to know that person. Now, what has happened here today is an incredible opportunity for doing real networking, sharing and communicating and interacting with people who, like you, want to do something that makes their lives better, who are interested in moving beyond themselves and into the community to be in service. Someone that you can call on, that can call on you to support you, perhaps come from California to help you put on your event. That is the kind of networking that successful businesswomen or simply successful women do. The at-home moms, they really get it. They network the carpool for carpool and carpool. They become friends with their kids' friends. They know where they are. They know whether those mothers have the same ideas about disciplining their children as they do. I would certainly get them in my network. So the meet and greet functions have a purpose. It's a nice thing to do. But if you're going to do it, do it with your purpose in mind and engage those folks and, con and connect with folks that you can move forward with, that will move forward with you. The, the uh, community, create a community, a community of learners where you and everyone in that group is both teacher and student. And when we're willing to interact and be with each other in that way, real magic can occur. Real magic can occur. That is one of the biggest things as an educator that I learned and that I shared with many other educators across this country. That if we want our students to learn and listen, you know, we must be willing to go there first. And that's what a leader does. They go there first. So that I'm willing to also listen to that young person and learn from them, as well as being the teacher so that they can also learn from me. But when I get to be just the total expert, it doesn't work. Join Monica in the she source circles and you could make it work. Step into a network opportunity that makes a difference, that creates a beloved community, that creates empowering relationships, that creates uh, support. Reach out and touch. Make sure in your community that those who often are not at the table, not even invited to the table, perceived not to have anything to bring to the table, that they are at the table. And be willing to be surprised. That's changing a mindset. That is moving beyond getting caught up and stuck in just only our own way of doing it and thinking about it. But engaging others in a way. You don't have to, to, to take anybody else's idea. You don't have to change your position. But be open. Be open to be influenced. 
That doesn't mean that you're going to be following along behind them. But it is important that you are open, open to be influenced, open to hear what's available. When I have such a narrow position and I'm stuck on it, it does not leave any room for me to lean in and seize an opportunity, a possibility that I may not have seen, that I may not have known, even existed. Transformation is making a difference. As I said earlier, being in service, sharing in a vision that is bigger than me. I think that Monica and Tony's vision is bigger than Monica. And what have they done that they do so well? They have enrolled you and me and tons of others in their vision. They have, been, they have brought their passion, and it has become our passion. When my phone rings and I see Monica Brothers on there, I just get ready to step up. And I bet you there are others of you in the room like that as well. Not step up because Monica is calling, but because I know that she's about something good in the world and something important and an opportunity, an opportunity for me to lean in and, and contribute, an opportunity to be in service. So making a difference, transformation is also making a difference, being in service, living the dream, such that you make it a reality, that you take the action that's necessary to make it happen. Now, how many of you have children? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have children in school? Grandchildren in school. My first grandson just went to college. I can't believe I'm that old. <laughs> but it is true. Like somebody said, I'll show you my driver's car, maybe. <laughs> and you'd believe me. But anyway, how many of you have children in your neighborhood? How many of you uh, know the school that serves your neighborhood? Great, good. I believe that we all know a young person. Now, you know, I've been all over the country uh, talking about the principles and concepts that are in my book, but focus really on citizens as educators and working after school. Uh, one of the things that I find is that any time a conversation comes up, it could have come up over lunch about education. Everybody has been to school. They went to elementary school, whatever, and they were in a classroom at one point in time, and they have something to say about school. The next, and so, the, you know, the conversation may start very philosophical, but the next thing you know, they are almost at a fist fight. It's a heated conversation. There's a trigger. You know, my child was in school, and you know what that teacher did? You know the teachers over at our school, they are teaching to the test. The kids aren't learning anything. I just don't know what we're going to do about education. Somebody has got to do something. Somebody's got to lead us out of this mess. I want the schools to do this. I don't want the schools to do that. And if teachers are at the table, you know if we had another set of parents, we could, get, we could, we could do our job. If you gave us another set of children, the children that are in here now, they're on those uh, diagonal smartphones. I spent half my day disciplining them. Get in your seat, Johnny. So a different set of children, and I could do my job. But that is not the way that it is. We have the parents that we have. We have the children that, that we have. And they're the right ones to be there. But there's this constant pull back and forth. We talk about improving 
education. And what we're really saying is improve our schools. Yes, but school is only one aspect of education. Education is broader, broader than schools. Young people learn everywhere. What do, who do you remember that taught you something that you haven't forgotten and that you still use when you were a child or as when you were in college or when you were in high school or just down on your neighborhood or at church or synagogue or temple, wherever? Bring that person to mind and bring to mind what they taught you. There was a woman in my community. She happened to have been my eighth grade teacher later, a social studies teacher. She is 95 now. You would never, ever know it. And I still am in contact with her. Two of my girlfriends and I used to go to her house all the time. She would have us in her home. I can remember that great big white house on the corner and her kitchen where sometime I'd be sitting on a stool talking. Well, she talked to us like we were grown up, but we also remembered our place and respected her. The one thing she taught me how to do that I will never forget among the many other things, there are other things too, but I will always remember this. She taught me how to make potato salad. She taught us how to make potato salad. And we learned to make potato salad. So finally, in home economics in junior high school, it was junior high school then, you know, back in the dark ages. <laughs> it's middle school now. We had a home economics class, and uh, the home economics teacher was, you know, Miss Perfection and very fastidious, and I loved her to death, needless to say. But she wanted everything right. We got her to agree to let us give Mrs. Coleman a surprise birthday party. She was delighted to do that because we were going to be putting into practical use what she was teaching us in class. Well, of course, Edith and Antoinette and I wanted to make potato salad because we'd learned how to do that for Miss Coleman. And what better way to honor her than to do prepared potato salad for her? So we all me and my little guy, we were there in the, um, in the kitchen and we were getting the meal together. And uh, So finally when everything was ready, we looked at the potato salad and it looked real white. <laughs> and we thought it's not yellow. We looked around to see what we could put in it to make it yellow. Well, there was no yellow food coloring there. So we couldn't do that. So we decided, now, I'm often credited with uh, leading them in this decision. I'm not sure that was true, but I'm giving credit for it. We put blue food coloring in the potato salad. Well, we thought that looked beautiful. About this time, Mrs. Thomas comes back into the class and she's ready for us to bring the food down to the library. And she says, ah, ah, what have you done? Well, it was too late to turn back. Everything else was ready. And oh, was she ever upset with us. In fact, the last time I saw her, when she was about 80, she said, oh, please don't bring that potato salad up. <laughs> she still had heartburn. So when we went to the library, years later, Ms. Coleman told me that Ms. Thomas came from, she says, Sally, don't you eat that potato salad thing, put food covering it. So Ms. Coleman said there was no way she was not going to eat that potato salad because we had prepared it with our hearts. So she was chuckling under her breath. She laughs to this day about that blue potato salad. Well, I still make potato salad for my family. I just don't put food covering in it anymore. <laughs> but I'm saying all that to say, Something as simple as how to make potato salad is a way to contribute to a young person's life that you can't imagine later on that they would use it. So there are some questions that you might ask yourself. If there is in your mind a problem in education, the book Community Educators is a resource for educating and developing our youth is about how 
you, me, each of us can contribute in a way that makes a difference in the lives of young people. Here in the Hampton Roads area, there are tons of programs. A Career Development Academy in Suffolk, with the firemen and the police leading it. It is an incredible experience for young people. I've been there. In Hampton, Virginia, there's Alternatives Incorporated, which is teaching kids leadership of, uh, skills. Uh, activists, they have a group called Youth Acts Together. Now, how about that for transformation? They called a meeting, a meeting of the communities of Hampton and Newport News and said, join us, come work with us. Our goal is to reduce and eliminate the number of dropouts in our high schools. We want to close the achievement gap and we know that you, individually and in your organizations and in your community can work with us and that together, together, we can accomplish these goals. That's student youth leadership. In uh, Utah, the Matizo Arts Program, and there's a story about these young kids, how they made a difference with respect to how the media treated the coverage of a young Latino boy who was killed because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the, the coverage had been about how he was perhaps a member of a gang. This was a very quiet young man. They taught this lesson to their community and to communities across the state. Is that it brings youth development, it brings community development. When citizens in the community think of education as broader than schools and that they have something to contribute, that they can contribute as well as the professionals in the school, but they contribute what they have to give. They are not trying to be the teachers. I am not talking about homeschooling. I am not talking about charter schools. I am not talking about going in and doing record keeping for the school. I am talking about what you can do in your neighborhood, in your church, in your uh, place of worship, what you can do in an organization, what you can do just knowing a child, a young person that can benefit from your business experience, that can benefit from being an entrepreneur. You have incredible gifts, talents, passion, and interests. Yes, they matter, but it won't matter unless you're willing to take action. It is the committed action that gets it done. It is the committed action that brings the possibility of a beloved community, personal transformation, empowered relationships, the kind of environment that you say you want. If that is what you want, Mahatma Gandhi would say to you, be the change you want in the world. Be the change you, you want. And if you be the change you want and give it, you will receive it. Not give it to receive it. I think I heard someone this morning say, you know, don't pressure your kids so much. Or don't let them, you know, let them swirl, not swinging in the wind, but swirl and struggle with coming through so that they know what it's like to come through uh, the difficult times. That we can't tell them everything that they have to find their way. They will learn that it was 
going to be. It's up to them. It's up to them. It's up to you. It's up to me to make a difference. One of the um, kinds of ex experiences that was uh, identified by participants in the study uh, that resulted in the book was that mentoring was a way that many of the programs worked. So all over this community, your social service organizations, uh, your um, civic organizations, but then there's you. Wouldn't it, what a possibility if a she source circle expanded their thinking beyond not just about themselves, but also what they could contribute in the community. But if we take those three things and we begin to put them in our lives, what is the legacy? What is your legacy? My legacy will not be stocks and bonds. It will not be a car, a house, or money. My legacy, that, I mean, you know, if I'm lucky enough to leave any of that, great for the generation behind me. But the legacy that's in my heart, the legacy that I say matters is the legacy that I will I want to live. I'm just going to do about two more minutes. <laughs> so the legacy that you leave must be the legacy that you live, so that we don't continue leaving the next generation our mess to start all over again. But we saw the problems that are in front of us to the extent that we can. And so that when we bring, when we leave the planet, that the next generation can begin and pick the problem up where we left off and do what they can to solve the problem. So I invite you to live your legacy and make a determination of what that is. Remember that transformation is choice. Choice is change. Change occurs with committed action. There is a postcard on your table. If you would take time before you leave to address this postcard to yourself, and on the postcard, write uh, a note to yourself that says with that within the next 30 days, I will lean into opportunity, da 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 that will take you and that will move you forward. Maybe it's in your personal life. Maybe it's um, in a relational transform transformational. Maybe it's in making a difference and being in service. Maybe it's in creating, a, a, with Monica, a she-source circle. Maybe it is creating a she-source circle about education or about entrepreneurism for youth. Whatever it is, what opportunity are you willing to lean in and leave that card on your table? Monica Taylor and others will collect the cards and in 30 days, at the end of, uh, what is today, the 6th of September, on the 6th of October, they will mail your card back to you so that you can actually see, well, did I do that yet? Am I still interested in doing that? Did I do something else? Or where am I on what I said I had passion for? and a commitment and willingness to do. I'll leave you with this thought. There is a poet 
that I love. And we've talked about transformation in many different ways. It is also um, in our capacity to listen. And I think that Hafiz puts it so beautifully. And you know, we listen to each other in so many ways. We listen and hear each other's voices. We listen to the body language. We listen to the deep breathing. We listen to the sighs. We listen to the expressions of joy that fill our faces. And so Hafi says, when I listen to you, I listen as if my most revered teacher is speaking. I invite you to listen to yourself, to each other, and others in and around your world as if they were your most 